Hello, Davos. It is so nice to be with you in person. In warm weather, they should do warm weather Davos all the time. This is great. <laughs> Yay. So nice to be here. Um, well, I'm here with a woman who needs absolutely no introduction, but I will try anyways. Susan Majitsky was employee number 16 at Google. She now runs YouTube, and if YouTube were its own standalone company, it would be number 121 on the Fortune 500 list. Um, she would be one of only 45 women to be on that list. She is one of the most powerful people in the world and in the world of business. She previously ran advertising for Google, um, and the company was actually created in her garage. She was trying to get uh, some money for rent, <laughs> and she rented it out to two guys who were building something, and Google. So thank you for that. Um, so Susan, on a little bit of a serious note, things are feeling a little bit dreary in Davos. I mean, mm -hmm. it is rainy, yes, but also um, economically, things aren't looking so great. We just ran a survey of the Fortune 500 CEOs, and 75% feel a recession is coming in the next year or two. So when you're looking at that, and you're running a big company like YouTube, how are you thinking about the rest of the year? How are you planning for a potential downturn? Sure. Well, first of all, it's great to be here, and uh, I agree, I like the, the nice weather. Uh, uh, but if we look at the economy and we look at the situation, there definitely are a lot of concerning macro trends. I mean, the war, um, inflation in the U.S., but I'd say with regard to YouTube's business and Google's business, we've always tried to take a long-term point of view. And we see tremendous growth across the board. Technology continues to be an area of growth. We continue to see a lot of users moving to digital, on-demand type of content. And so like, when you go through a downturn, I think it's important to keep that long-term view. There may be areas that you, um, you know, there may be areas where we may decide to delay starting a certain project, but in general, we're still saying like, this is an important business, we're gonna grow, we're gonna continue to invest here. Um, what I have found this really interesting is during downturns is that we actually get better at what we do. And when your numbers are going up all the time, it's really easy to just be like, oh, okay, you know, things are good. Um, when they're going down or they're not going as fast as you expect, suddenly you are really digging into the details. And so having been through a couple recessions at Google, that has been my experience. But I'd say in general, we're building for the long term and that's what we'll focus on. Got it, so no hiring freeze, continuing a little bit cautiously, but as planned. Um, and that comes from, what, three recessions you've, been, you've watched at, at Google and YouTube? Well, hopefully we won't have a third. Exactly. I have been through two so far, and um, it's challenging. I mean, there's no doubt about it, but you, I think you do come out of it stronger as a result. So one of the uh, reasons that there is this dreariness is there's a war going on, um, and the war has definitely impacted all businesses, um, global businesses, and it's certainly impacted Google and YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of social media companies have actually been banned. Mm -hmm. uh, YouTube has not. It's still mm -hmm. up and running. You're not monetizing there anymore. Um, but how do you view YouTube's role in times of war? Mm -hmm. So YouTube definitely is still serving in Russia, like you mentioned, and it has been, as soon as the war broke out, we realized this was an incredibly important time for us to get it right with regard to our responsibility. And you know, we made a number of really, really tough decisions. One of them involved how we handled Russian state-sponsored media. Um, we had lots of requests from various governments, but looking at our, our policy framework, we also decided to suspend that media globally. Um, we also extended our policies with regard to how we handle verified violent events. So an event that denies something like the Holocaust would be against the YouTube policies. Uh, and what we saw is there was, if there was denial or trivialization associated with, with, the conflict, with the war in Ukraine, that would also become a violation. So the first and most important thing for us was to really focus on the responsibility, figure out how we could be good players in making sure that users can get authoritative and the right information. And what we're really seeing in this conflict is that information does play a key role, that there can, information can be weaponized, and that's why we wanted to focus so much on, on making sure that we both have the right policies and the enforcement associated with that. 
The reason we are still serving in Russia, and we believe that that is important, is that we're able to, to deliver independent news into Russia. And so the average citizen in Russia can access for free the same information that you can access here from, from Davos, which we believe is really important to be able to help citizens know what's going on and have perspectives from the outside world. Uh, we've also seen YouTube be used for all kinds of other humanitarian reasons like medical doctors, like serving um, patients on the battlefield, education of kids in Ukraine, um, in Ukrainian um, language. So we definitely have seen a lot of really important humanitarian cases too. Russia um, may not have banned YouTube yet, but at the same time, it's trying to push people towards something called RuTube. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are these kind of clones popping up in other places. I mean, do you view um, this as more a, of a one-off, or is this a trend where we might see social media, instead of being global, start to be more local? I mean, you pair that with antitrust and how China's doing social media. There's a lot of different things at play here. We've definitely seen new emerging players. Um, I like RuTube, I'm, I'm less sure about. It doesn't uh, seem but, to be going well. Um, yeah, it's. I haven't used it, to be fair. Um, but what we, where we do see a lot of growth is actually in short form content coming out of Asia, where we've seen just a tr tremendous amount of new innovations and creation. And I, I do think video is a very competitive emerging market right now, and I expect us to continue to see more players. I think you know, TikTok, obviously, mm -hmm. that growth story has been pretty incredible to watch. YouTube has not been allowed to operate in China, um, but when China decides to create its own social media platform and puts a ton of resources behind it, mm -hmm. and it can corner that market and then scale to the rest of the world, I mean, mm -hmm. that's a pretty powerful recipe. How do you think that, um, what does that mean for companies being created in the US? Does that threaten the US as a superpower? How do you think about that? We definitely are seeing really strong competition coming out of China, particularly with TikTok. And you know, we saw that grow relatively fast. I mean, I can tell you that you would not have asked me about TikTok at Davos the last time that we held it. No. So uh, that shows you just how quickly this is changing. And you know, if you look at, at TikTok too, they've had Doyen um, and they've had the opportunity to invest in, in China on a local market and YouTube does not operate in China. So you could argue that yes, you know, it gives us some blind spot because they're, they're developing a set of content there where we're not participating and part of that market. Uh, so I do think we'll see more competition coming out of China. They certainly have a lot of technical expertise and it's an area we should just be ready for and continue to invest in. So short form video seems to be all the rage. Creators are really getting into it in a strong way. And you have YouTube Shorts. Um, I believe you have three S's you're focused on, shopping, shorts, and streaming. So we can dig into mm -hmm. each of them a little bit. But I'm curious about, about short form video. Is that a trend that's here to stay? The first ever YouTube video is only 18 seconds long. Yes. So maybe it's just coming back to, to home a little bit for you. But how do you think about short form and what that'll do to advertising? So the, yes, the first video ever uploaded to YouTube, Me at the Zoo, was only 18 seconds long. And we do see short form growing tremendously. And we also see, I mean, YouTube's invested a lot in what we call long form. It's actually funny that we're talking about YouTube now being a longer form content because traditionally it was shorter form, right? Compared to linear TV, which was always 30 minutes, 60 minutes. And so when we say long form, we're often talking about like five minutes. Um, and that's just compared to TikTok that is often under a minute. So we do definitely see that users are engaging a lot, particularly younger users find that a really compelling media. We are investing a huge amount into it. We want to make sure that users can um, you know, see that on YouTube. But we also think that creators really like it. And it is attracting a new set of creators. And if you think about it, it's easier because you have just your phone. You don't have to create as much content. We can actually explore short form content a lot faster, meaning we can recommend a lot of new content to you because it's, in a sense, a lower risk for us. Like, we, you know, if it's if we wanted to show you a new video, it's five minutes long and you don't like it, that would be a problem. Whereas we can just show you lots and lots of short form content and you can explore that and d discover new creators. So it is an area that we're investing a lot in. I expect to see a lot of competition there. 
and it certainly is probably the fastest part of the market right now. Mm. And another part of the creator economy that you're growing there is shopping. What are YouTube's shopping ambitions? Are you going to go head-to-head with Amazon someday? Are we getting into <laughs> that direction? Where is it heading? So we see that people go to YouTube and they research a lot of products. Uh, they, um, like we've run surveys, like there was a talk shop survey that said uh, over 85% of people go and research products on YouTube. They make a faster decision as a result of the products that they see on YouTube. And YouTube also has a lot of how-to where people are discovering new products or how to use. They want to do an art project. They want to do a makeup tutorial. They want to fix their car. And so there is an opportunity to figure out, okay, well, like, what are the goods that I need? How do I, how do I buy them um, to do this project that I'm seeing on YouTube? And so what we've really wanted to do is just connect the ability to see them in the video to how to buy them. And it's really like connecting that last mile. And so what we're doing is enabling videos to actually link to specific products, have those products uh, you know, very accessible, and then be able to buy them afterwards. So I don't think about us as competing directly with e uh, retailers um, like Amazon. I think about us being a way for you to find products that you're already researching on YouTube um, and potentially like also find and discover more um, more goods, right? YouTube is a site sound in motion. It's an opportunity to explore, see, feel, touch. Um, and so we're hopeful that, that more users and brands will work with us to make it easy to purchase. Mm. And the third S was streaming. Yeah. So talk about um, the fight to get into the living room and how that's going. There's a lot of competition. It seems like Apple can definitely win that space pretty easily if it wants to, and I think it wants to, so how's it going? Yeah, well, living room uh, is a big space for us. Um, we have in the US, for example, we have over 135 million people who are streaming into the living room, so we think we're the largest media player in the living room, and, and um, we think well, there's a lot more that we can do there. And if you think about it, it's because the content's on demand, it's nice to be in the living room to be able to see that. We're also working to be able to have your phone be a way of actually um, managing or, or potentially engaging with the videos that you see. Um, and so we do see this as being a very successful way for our users to engage and to watch more content. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, well we'll see how that continues. Yeah. You know, I can't not ask you about misinformation. It sure. is a problem that plagues every social media platform, but it's, it definitely plagues YouTube, and I know you've done a lot to put policies in place, tweak algorithms, to recommend the right things. Um, but I have to wonder, uh, in, in January, a global coalition of fact-checking organizations found YouTube to be a major conduit of fake news, despite all that you've put in place. So is this just a flaw in social media platforms that cannot be rectified? I mean, can we ever actually solve this or is it just a problem that cannot be solved in the current way of platforms being operated? We're definitely investing a huge amount to make sure that we're fighting misinformation and there are a number of different ways that we look at this. So the first would be from a policy standpoint, we would look at content that we would think about in terms of being violative of our policies. So if you look at COVID, for example, we came up with 10 different policies that we said would be violative. Like an example of that would be saying that COVID came from something other than a virus. And we did see people attacking 5G equipment, for example, because they thought that it was causing COVID. And so that would just be an example of a policy that we'd remove. So we do remove content based on those policies. We actually publish that on, in a transparency report. Uh, the second one would be really raising up authoritative information. So. If you are dealing with a sensitive subject like news, uh, health, uh, science, we are going to make sure that what we're recommending is coming from a trusted, well-known publisher that can be reliable. Uh, and you know, if you think about how Google works, it's very similar. Like if you type in cancer or you type in COVID, what you're going to get are going to be names that you recognize. They're not going to be someone that just published a web page yesterday. So it's very similar with regard to how we handle that on YouTube. The third is making sure that we, if there's content that's borderline 
content um, that technically meets our policy but is lower quality, that's content that we basically will not recommend to our users. Our users could still access it, but they will not recommend it. Um, and then lastly, we're just really careful about what we monetize, so we always want to make sure that there's no incentive. So for example, with regard to climate change, we don't monetize any kind of climate change material. So there's no incentive for you to keep publishing that material that is propagating something that is generally understood as um, not accurate information. So I, I mean, mis misinformation is not new to the internet. It's been around since before, before you know, for all time. But we definitely see that there is a role for, uh, and there is a risk, and that's why we have put a lot of effort um, I ha this report that you cited, I haven't seen that report, but there certainly are many other reports that give us a, a good grade there. And I think if you look at the work that we have done across the board, it really shows a, a you know, very significant improvement. We came out with a, pol with a set of data that we thought was really useful, which is how much content that is violative are we not catching with our enforcement? And um, that is about 10 to 12 videos per 100,000 views. And um, if you look at the chart in terms of how that's changed over time, that number has come down significantly and our plan is to continue to work on it and make sure that we continue to reduce that. So it sounds like very to the extent that you can, things that are not credible sources and don't recommend, um, but also still sounds like a work in progress. Do you think it always will be a work in progress? I think there'll always be work that we have to do because there will always be incentives for people to be creating misinformation. And the challenge will be to keep staying ahead of that and make sure that we are understanding what they are um, and the different ways that people may use to try to trick our systems um, and make sure that our systems are staying ahead of what's necessary to make sure that we are managing that. So I think there'll always be work, but I, I you know, after all this work that we have put in, this has been a huge initiative for us for at least over you know, five, six years. I, I think we've come a long way, and I would challenge you if you go and you look um, and you do a search or you look at your homepage in terms of what you're seeing, you're gonna see content. When it comes to sensitive topics, you're gonna see them coming from more authoritative sources. Mm -hmm. Okay. Moving um, to antitrust, sure. I mean, there's a lot that could impact big tech and certainly mm -hmm. Alphabet, Google. Yeah. Um, how are you navigating that internally um, with the broader executive team? Well, anti antitrust is definitely a big issue. Um, you know, I think there's certain le legislation that's in place. You know, in general, what I'm mostly focused on is just how can we do the right thing for our users, our advertisers, our creators. Uh, and if I look at what those demands are from those three constituents that we serve, like they're not necessarily asking me for something that I'm hearing from the regulators with regard to antitrust. So like my goal is like, how do I provide the best content for our users? How do we make sure advertisers get the return? And our creator economy, which has really grown significantly, which is powering a lot of jobs, a lot of GDP, like how do we make sure that we continue to grow that? So like in the US alone, uh, YouTube provides 20 billion in GDP and almost 400,000 jobs. So. Uh, like, I, you know, again, we're always open to hearing. We work with many governments. We want to hear what their concerns are, but my focus mostly has just been serving our constituents. Mm -hmm. And as regulation comes out, like, we'll continue to work and discuss with regulators. Got it. Um, and you mentioned, obviously, YouTube was one of the, maybe was the first creator economy huh. company. Um, now there's a number of them, but you were the first. Uh, are we in a creator economy bubble? Like, can everybody just continue to be infinite creators, making money and quitting their jobs, and you know, make, and creating livable wages on YouTube and other places, or is this going to burst? Well, not everyone, um, but there are many people who like to be creators, and certainly with short form content, we see more people wanting to be creators. And but we are seeing a lot of growth. This is this is a real uh, this is a real career for people, mm -hmm. and. If we look at the number of creators, for example, who are generating $10,000 or more, we've seen a 40% increase just in the last year. 
And you know, we do see people start a channel. A lot of times it's about their passion, about something that they care about, a hobby. Um, so for example, like there was this channel that just got started during the pandemic. It was called Made with Lao. It was a family that had a Chinese restaurant and they went out of business during the pandemic, like a lot of restaurants, because they didn't have customers. And they started a channel. Um, it's a father and son. They now have over 750,000 creators. It actually has really amazing food that you see it at all the Chinese restaurants, like how to actually cook it. So I, I do believe this is a real opportunity and, and creators are, 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 are media companies. They have a brand, they have a global audience, they do produce content, they, have, they hire people to do you know, products, editing, all the rest. So I, look, I think that we're gonna continue to see more creators and what we see is that creators have actually expanded, that other platforms have now embraced that and other platforms are now trying to get creators to come on their platform. And you know, we also see advertisers, a lot of advertisers are now engaging with creators to try to figure out how can they have them work with their product and continue to promote the, their own products. It definitely seems like the hot job. I mean, we did a Gen Z survey um, when I was at Business Insider, and the number one job of Gen Z was they all wanted to be creators. They wanted to be YouTube <laughs> influencers and stars, which is kind of terrifying. I mean, you're a mom of five. If one of your kids was like, hey, mom, can I be a YouTube creator? I mean, what's, is that good for the world? Is that what you want for your kid? Creators, ki kids, like, like, we'll see young adults who will say that they want to be a creator, and a lot of times kids you know certainly will continue to evolve and you know they say like they want to be musicians and they want to have all kinds of jobs that attract um, fame and fortune right I mean those are very popular jobs and obviously not everyone can achieve that but you know we certainly see that on a whole this is a growing economy it is they are real jobs and we do see that you know, when kids, uh, when, you know, someone creates a channel, if you have someone becoming a creator, they need to talk about what's important to them, like choosing a topic, articulating it, presenting it well. Um, and, you know, we also want to make sure that people can do that in a private way, not just, like, sometimes people don't always want to share that with the world, but they may want to just do it for their family or a way of sharing that privately, mm -hmm. which is, I think, is a really important option as well. Yeah. But you do limit screen time and things, or you did when they were growing up? I do limit screen time for, for um, younger kids, <laughs> yes. I mean, look, I, I grew up without the internet, I grew up without technology, and I think it's really important for there to always be balance. And there's a lot of benefits of technology, there's a lot of information you can look up, there's a lot of ways you can have access that you never had beforehand, but like anything, too much of anything is not a good thing and you wanna have balance. So that's what I personally have recommended, but I realize that parenting is very personal, everyone has their own perspective, um, and so I can only really speak for myself. Yeah, fair enough. Um, well, it's a really hard time to be a leader, so I wanna ask you some leadership questions okay. that probably a lot of people are grappling with. Um, first and foremost, it's more than ever, there's a lot of pressure to weigh in on societal issues mm -hmm. um, for CEOs. You can't just sit on the sidelines and have your employee base be okay with it, or even your customer base be okay with it. You kind of have to take a side and have an opinion. In the States, one of the big things happening right now is Roe v. Wade, um, which is a woman's right to an abortion. Um, a lot of executives have not spoken out about this. It's complicated. If they do, it could be illegal um, at some points. But Susan, I do have to ask you, you are one of the most powerful women in the world and you're an incredibly powerful executive. So what is your stance on Roe v. Wade? My stance is that women should have a choice when they become a mother. I believe that's really important. I believe that reproductive rights are human rights and to take away a law and a right that we've had for almost 50 years will be a big setback for women. But that's my personal view. Running a company that has, a, that really focuses on free speech, we wanna make sure that we're enabling a broad set of opinions, that everyone has a right to express their point of view provided they meet our community guidelines. So it, this is, um, you know, this is going to be complicated legislation, as you said. Like people will want us to speak out on it. 
it's also draft right now. And so there's not definitive language. Uh, like once we saw it, we started to look and then try to anticipate what kind of changes that would have for our business. For example, employees, like what kind of benefits would we want to offer to employees who could be in states where abortion is no longer allowed? Or what implications could that have for our advertising business? Maybe um, content misinformation. There could be ways that could be um, spun. For example, people saying, oh, abortion is not allowed in this state when it really is. So this has led us to realize that there's going to be a lot of work for us to understand what this legislation is and what are the right ways for us to comply with it. And how are you talking to your employees about it? Are they, are they demanding answers from leadership? Are they, you know, how, how is it going talking to employees about sensitive situations like this? Well, employees always ask us lots of questions. And um, just so you all know, we actually do company all hands almost, well, I do a company all hands every Friday where anyone in the company can ask me anything. Um, and so, as you can imagine, I get a lot of questions about everything following our business and things that don't even involve our business. Like this is not, um, this is a decision that is of course completely out of our hands. Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, our goal generally is to speak up on the issues that we see really matter to our employees and that really matter to our user base. And this is an issue that is gonna have dramatic implications you know, because it's early and it's draft. We haven't, we have spoken internally you know, at, at a high level, but you know, we're still waiting to understand what the final wording is and what the final implications are. And you know, based on what, what is actual real, then you know, we'll take whatever necessary steps in terms of having to comply with it, but also try to figure out how to make sure that we are supporting our employees um, and doing doing what we can um, to interpret this in a way that makes sense for our user base right. and employees. Well, thank you for your candor on a really difficult topic. I appreciate it. Sure. Um, another topic that people are really grappling with running companies is the return to the office. It's yes. really hard. And Google and Alphabet and YouTube are trying to do probably one of the most ambitious things on the planet, which is bring hybrid into reality. I think it's sort of a mandate to do three days a week, started April 4th. How is that going? It seems like the gold yes. standard, you want it to work, but really, really hard. It's been good and bad. Um, it's probably the honest answer. Um, I think good in the sense that it's really great to see coworkers that you haven't seen for a long time. It's fun to bring everyone back together. Um, that said, like now that we're bringing back people back together, I realize like a lot of people have actually moved um, and are no longer in the same location. So we just had a lot of people move during the pandemic and we are a much more distributed company than we ever were beforehand. We also uh, are now three days a week, which actually, like, I don't know how we did five days a week. Um, like, I think we all readjusted to just the three days, or we readjusted to being at home. So that's just a re, that's an, definitely an adjustment. And what I'm also seeing is that people are coming into the office, but they might not be coming in at the same times that they used to be coming in. And maybe that's okay, because there was a lot of time spent commuting, and that's not necessarily a good use of time. You're not with your family, you're not doing work, and so we may see people doing things like doing some work, coming in later to, meet, to miss a commute time, come in, like do most important meetings, and then come back, go back home. So. It, it is an adjustment. I think there's a lot of tech event investments that need to continue to evolve. So like having, you know, we got, I got used to seeing every single person in a little box with their name underneath. I could tell when they were talking. I actually really like the closed captioning. So if I miss something, I can see that. I miss that in real life. I'm like, where's the closed captioning? Um, I, wish, I wish we could have that. But then when you put 20 people and they're in a conference room, it's really hard to tell who, who was talking. How can they see you? So I still think there's work to do on the tech for hybrid, and we're still adjusting. And then you know, also in the Bay Area, we just had a surge. So even though people were coming back, a lot of people had COVID. You know, what's the 
you know, we have clear policies around this, but you as a company have to come up with it. Like if, if you're sitting next to someone and they're like, oh yeah, everyone in my family has COVID right now. Like it could be an uncomfortable moment. Um, and technically, right? So, I mean, we have rules about how we handle that, what's required, but it's, a, it's something we're all still figuring out. So for final question, um, as I mentioned earlier, if YouTube were its own standalone company, you'd be the 45th woman um, to be running a Fortune 500 company. Mm -hmm. I think YouTube would actually fall about number 121. I had the team pulled the numbers right before this interview. Um, is, that, is that using our ads revenue? Yes. 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 So maybe even Yes, higher. we also have subscription revenue. Yes, so you'd be higher. You'd be higher. There you go. OK, okay. Just, right up that just, chart. Just needed to <laughs> yeah, so get maybe, that out maybe, there. Maybe be in the Fortune 100. There you go. Um, <laughs> is that? <laughs> Is that something that you'd like to solidify someday? Do you think, like, you're, you've got a great gig at YouTube, no doubt, but, yeah. you know, how do you think about the CEO <clears throat> progression, your role, and then a separate note, a lot of younger generations aren't aspiring to the C-suite anymore. Mm. There's sort of this anti-hustle um, culture setting in where they just think they'll never make it. They think the system's unfair. So um, how do you think about your own C-suite journey, and how would you think about the fact that maybe others don't want that right now? Well, my journey was not to be in the C-suite necessarily. Like I, I mean, just to be clear, I joined a company with no revenue at all, um, with no real business plan. And I just joined it because I thought it was really interesting and they were doing important things for the world, which was delivering information. And I immediately saw the value. And then I you know, worked at Google for a long time and did ads. And then I came to YouTube, right, which also was like much smaller. But I saw, again, the same thing, a lot of value in enabling new ways of communication and new types of media and new points of view. So my personal career advice that I took and that I give to others is to find something that's meaningful to you that where you believe you're doing something good for the world. And if you do that, then you will most likely have a productive career. Um, and if you say, oh, like, I just want to be in the C-suite, like, you probably will, it's, like, harder to have a productive career, right? Because that's not necessarily a clear role that you can follow or figure out, you know, how to, how to do that. So, um, and in some ways it really helped me because I was just always willing to say more controversial things. Like, I would just say, like, this is my point of view. Like, I'm working for our users, our creators, and our advertisers. And if I think something is the right thing to do, like, I'll just say that. And it might not be the popular point of view, but like, you actually that's okay. You suggested buying YouTube, right? Didn't you put together a whole presentation? Yeah, I suggested buying YouTube. It wasn't necessarily a popular point of view. Somebody published, Mark Cuban actually, the week beforehand said, only a moron would buy YouTube. <laughs> so so, so I you mean, bought it. I think it's really important to be able to take the, like to think for yourself and, and realize like what's important, what matters to my constituents, like who am I working for, why am I working, what am I, why am I doing all this? And so I have really focused on trying to do something productive and good for the world. It's, my whole career has been about information, information empowerment, and that what, that's what has led me to where I am right now. And it just happened to be that I was in the C-suite. Um, actually, when I first joined YouTube, this is like, when I first joined YouTube, my title was not CEO. So Wikipedia immediately recognized that there should be a CEO of YouTube. But technically, my title was SVP of YouTube. Um, and I had to explain to people externally that I was acting like the CEO. Because if there wasn't a CEO, they'd be like, well, who, who is the CEO? But my <laughs> internal title was initially SVP. And so I had to work it out that, yes, my title was CEO of YouTube. Yeah. So again, I think that's just the same message, which is focus on what's important. Don't focus on the title. Don't focus on, on the things that don't really matter. The things that matter are getting, doing something valuable and important for the world and being able to do that well. Okay. Well, Susan Wojcicki, everybody, thank you so much for joining me.